started and stopped the no the recording stopped okay so once again let's start again uh, September 18 meeting of the OC developer team immersion program in in stock right now for the next two weeks still so on the development the main effort page you see there's a little bump of development so that is the f several full-time people here working on development we're shaking down we, we did most of the by now we've done most of the instructionals for the 3d printer so really detailed several hundred pages of that uh, pretty epic effort at that point and continuing forward just uh, we're discussing a lot about marketing how do we get the products out there and, and the different things we're working on our kids there's uh, two-day immersion training for teachers as well as just the standard build your printer in a day kind of workshop so that's that's the main thing we we did a sample workshop in st joseph last weekend so that was saturday i uh, had a few people show up where we had our our people so it's sarah alex and dixon uh, pretty much teaching the people that participated. There were four people that showed up to that besides ourselves. And that was a great experience just to show what it looks like to take a, take a workshop on the road. And this weekend we're looking at doing a workshop in another library where we demonstrate the, the filament maker, the, the grinder, and the printer. So basically like a couple of hours, um, couple of hours basically a demo where it's more about informative not building a 3d printer but a demo about the whole picture of open source ecology the greater framework see the lyman filament makers behind me over there hanging on the wall um, but demonstrating that for the the broader public and see how that works and also for next week we're trying to organize a two-day teachers workshop see if we can line up something on such a short scale um, but we've yet to uh, finish building more printers as everybody's taken home three 3d printers for their little print cluster, as well as the filament maker and grinder. Now, we're, for now, we're just forgetting about the laser cutter and the CNC uh, circuit mill, simply because, I mean, it's really intense and not enough time to cover all of that in the kind of detail that would make it useful at this point. So, but since we're be this is the beginning of a journey, we'll continue with that and develop, continue working on the whole open source microfactory as time goes on. So that's a brief report from here, and let's see who else we have for for more milestones. Um, let's see who else would like to to report also today on latest updates. Maybe let's see. Mark. Yeah, I can report real quick. Okay, John. Yeah. So on the uh, dev team, I'm still working on the uh, the 12 inch uh, PVC uh, frame. And uh, so far, I got the, uh, the frame modeled out, so it's working great. I uh, produced a new um, j drilling jig for the 3D printer. Mm -hmm. Have some photos up on my uh, page there. So that jig worked out great. Um, so I have some holes drilled and just uh, waiting to uh, you know, finally get done and get enough time to wrap up the build and uh, get some prints out of this guy. So, yeah. yep, just continuing on that and hoping to be done soon here. <laughs> right, right, yeah, it takes, yep. takes time. And we've been shaking down the Prusa i3 MK2 extruder, so we've been running that to print parts. Now we found some issues on it, so we are actually using the the official right. uh, E3D version, not a clone, because we had issues with the clone. It keeps plugging up, like. Thanks. Um, so we got the the original, and same issues though. Like we have to date not been able to run it effectively with retraction. When you disable a retraction, everything seems to work, but when you enable a retraction, um, I don't know what we're doing, if it's something that we might be doing wrong, but I don't know. I mean, we don't seem to be following the instructions exactly as far as how to put it together. We're careful about the Teflon liner, how it's supposed to go in and end like right before the hot zone. And right. mechanically, it seems to be all robust and everything, but it was calibrated calibrate, calibrate e steps per millimeter and all that kind of stuff, and it yeah. goes out with a uh, micrometer and all. Oh, or yeah. a, uh, so right. do you think? Yeah, yeah. No, we actually have been using the value from before, which worked, but I that's like the only missing yeah. link. I, I, I so you know, so the method for calibration for that is just the yeah. real easiest way to do it, real briefly, is just take. Um, put a mark, a sharpie on something, 
Right. Uh, and then you know, there's there's a uh, actual command. I forget how you know my mark it up and mailed out what the uh, command is. And you just say, hey, extrude this much. It's a raw command to the extruder. You measure how much it actually moves and use basic math to come up with a difference. It's a really easy calibration to do. So I'd address that. Yeah. So have you heard reports that that would uh, foul up the retraction? Because see, it works when you disable retraction. And it right. Gets, it's so poly prints. Right. So that's what that's what I that's not, that's only you know, yeah. <laughs> just seems like one one thing to yeah. check, but yeah, like yeah. retraction, no. it's just yeah. retraction speed and the uh, delta v and the rest of the stuff. Yeah. It could be issues with the, with that, and so I look into those. Your acceleration on retract. That's a good question. So oh, interesting, yeah. So we haven't messed around a lot with those settings. We basically use the stock settings that were found in Lowell's Bob Cura, but there is a setting for the distance of retraction and its speed. So we yeah, can maybe like right. reduce that a bit and see if that will work. Because I noticed that the, in a Lowell's Bob manual it says, uh, so I'm going into, let me share my right. screen actually Thanks. here. But yeah, that's uh. So to share my screen, if you look at Cura on my screen, so there's yeah. under advanced you got retraction, speed, and distance. So for speed, so it's forty millimeters per second right now. Uh, that that does seem high. Any thoughts on that? Because I saw in the, in, the, in the manual it says recommended speed is 25 for cure for, for Lowe's Cura, but I don't know why they have default that's 40. So maybe just reduce that and maybe reduce the retraction distance. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I do two things. I, I double just you, know, you might be slightly off on your steps. I recalibrate that and get yeah, it for yeah. sure number uh, yep. based on a sample of your modified thing. Then secondly, for uh, speed, I would make your speed. Um, just like, uh, you know, what I usually work is like 10 to 5 millimeters more than your uh, normal um, printing speed, yeah, millimeters per second that you're using for actual printing. Just go and put up like 10 and 5 and just kind of, it's really just setting out a bench and just repeating that and stepping it up by 5 until you get a good result uh, from your base printing speed that you're using. So you're using... Well, print speed right now is 50 millimeters per second, and retraction speed is 40 millimeters per second at present. Yeah, so um, yeah, stepping, but, stepping, yeah, stepping down from, yeah, maybe yeah. step down as well, so yeah. Huh. Yeah, okay, that's definitely worth trying, because I haven't messed with that. My theory on that is, is like you said, if the e-steps are not correct, what may be happening is upon retraction you're perhaps like pulling in more than you should and therefore you're actually backing filament up and when the retractions are I, are I, often they could actually build up yeah i know i'm not being clear but that's kind of that's kind of my hunch right here is this, yeah, i yeah. guess that that's so what i was saying you know um back it up slow it down make it less yep. than what your current Printing speed is because I was that as I was thinking maybe he'd need to increase, but it looks like it's they're just about the same. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's just pulling out because when you're pushing down, you're ready when you first set up your printer, you are um, you know, extruding a little bit of um filament just to get started printing, but then when you're retracting, if it pulls out, you says aren't right, it's less forgiving because, like you said, you're gonna pull out too much, have an air gap, yeah, and that's gonna yeah, yeah. cause um, mm -hmm. yeah, some maybe some cold filament you got it yeah yeah yep. no no i, I think check that. yeah yeah that'll be that'll be it and and that was like the, that's the only thing i think we we shake that down and see where it goes from there but other than that we actually um did start running the um now the titan arrow so we're running that as well okay. here uh that works better and we're using some because we're starting to use some of the bigger nozzles but yeah that's work in progress because the Titan Arrow. The advantage of that is it's much simpler to build than the Prusa i3 MK2. I mean, the Prusa, yeah. yeah, that is one hell of a complicated build. And feedback from our people here is like, wow, it's uh, you know they're still having trouble picking all that up. But when we think about if we were to build that in public, I mean, it's it would be really yeah. challenging for people to complete that unless we actually bring the the extruders completed to the workshop builds. You know, so exactly. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so, you know, hopefully we'll work on park production and all the rest, but I'm about wrapping this up hopefully this week. And uh, the last uh, innovation I have uh, on mm-hmm. this, yep. I have uh, produced in the part that I'll probably be publishing tonight that is a friction grip on the PVC. Okay. So it's just a magnetic adapter for PVC. So just by friction, by um, providing tension on, on a bolt, it will grip onto the PVC. And it'll provide a magnetic mount hard point to uh-huh. the PVC frame. So that's your mouth. So it's just is like, that? yep. And so then you eliminate drilling. Oh, interesting. You process entirely, and you have uh, more printed parts. But so, huh. that, so that might provide some uh, interesting stuff. You can also use uh, metal pipes or who knows what after that. But um, oh wow, you know, no, that's that's what you're looking into. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's good. I think there's huge potential in a PVC or a standard standard pipe frames because they're just readily accessible as opposed to going to a CNC shop and, and cutting the metal. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so you, the use for, it will be very useful when you can actually help us really shake down the Prusai 3 MK2 settings for what we do regarding yeah, the, the, per, the persistent retraction issue. So, uh, <coughs> so yeah. metrology stuff and engineering stuff I can really uh, disseminate on that. So hopefully yeah. help. But yeah, I we'll have a little bit more time this week, I'm hoping, than another week. So let's we'll okay. get to. Okay, excellent, excellent. That would be good to help us shake that down. Okay, um, thank you, John. So who else um, do we have a report from? Miles, do you have some yeah. some more work to report on? Miles, are you there? Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah, working on a, on a diagram for the the flyback configuration of the power supply, and it seems like the uh, the cost of components. Not including the um, not including the microcontroller and the display, mm-hmm. uh, is around seventy dollars, which uh-huh. is actually pretty good considering we don't have the economies of scale or anything. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, what's how scalable the power supply that we're going to make? How scalable is it? Then then it's actually easy to scale it up, right? Like we can make it to go to higher power, or what's the limit on the power that we can do with a power supply? Um, well, I I was designing it for about 500 watts, so yeah. like 24 volts down mm-hmm. to around 12 volts. Okay. Um, yeah, a total of 500 watts. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Flyback selected some parts on Tuesday, September. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so for whoever missed Miles' work before, he did do a nice video about using Cukes or quite universal circuit simulator to actually run through what the output waveform is going to be for this power supply. So that's that's cool stuff. Take a look at that. Um, yeah, and what what are your next steps at this point? Uh, so I want to get this schematic done up and then uh, just look over that and then see if I can order some parts and put it together. Right, and to to prototype it, what is that going to be like on a breadboard or? Yeah, probably breadboard or one of those boards where you can uh, solder onto it. Yeah, okay. No, that sounds great. Um, how about Jesse? Jesse, um, you're on a call here. Any words? Any updates on your side? Tell us what you're doing. Yeah, um, I've been working on just uh, the experimental driving of the. Um, Power transistors with the pulse from the Arduino. Uh huh. So I've got, yeah, I got some various code I messed with with the Arduino. These are uh, things that would change the pulse with modulation frequency. Yeah. And then I got a bunch of meters because I was kind of blind for some of these forces I was working with. So I got an LCR meter and a little handheld oscilloscope. And mm-hmm. with that I can actually see the output signals. And I managed to drive a small uh, IRF 540. And MOSFET with the pulse from the Arduino just today, actually. Oh, yeah. I'm using that to drive a small fan at around 16 volts. This is just uh, for me to understand it, really. Yeah. Scale it up. Uh huh. What's the power handling ability of the, the MOSFET you're using? I'm just using a small one right now. And my idea was if I could get this small one to drive something like the 16 volts from a, a um, direct non-alternating voltage source, then I could use that pulse from the from the smaller transistor to drive one of the bigger ones, mm-hmm. and then we could really get into switching some high amounts of power, maybe more scalably, but I'd have to understand this first. Yeah, 
is like the, the yes, it's the higher one. So driving larger, larger power handling elements now. So is that like an, a route to a DIY? You're essentially talking about a gate driver for a larger power element, right? Yeah. So it's like an open source route I to do that. From a gate driver, and and what is the reason for that? Um, I did have some gate drivers before, uh -huh. and I was trying to mess with them as well. And yep. really, I'm just trying to make this a more accessible technology for yeah. myself. I've never worked with them, and there's a lot going on. There's there's harmonics you have to worry about in the signal. There's uh, whatever coil you use for your inductor, the magnetics have to be well understood. There's all areas where mm -hmm. you leak and stuff. So, yeah, I'm just trying to get an experimental setup work so that I can understand this better. That sounds good. That sounds good. So you can teach teach the rest of us more more about your learning. So that's good. Some in progress work on the universal power supply concept. Some of the basics of using Arduinos to to drive power elements, which is a great application relevant to induction furnace, your welder, power supplies, everything. That's the power electronics side of our work. So that's good. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, Abe, do we have you on the team here today? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I got my mic working. Um, yeah, I've done a few things. Try and mainly to solve some problems in, in FreeCAD. So I'm a little behind on learning some of that, but uh, also trying to figure out how to uh, utilize Git better. I had put files on uh, the Carpac and stuff on, on GitHub before, and uh, that I, I had just been uploading the files there, but as I've been understanding uh, Git a little better. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to restructure that better, and I, I see no reason not to migrate or just put files on, on, on GitLab instead of GitHub, because mm -hmm. any issues and things that we may have with GitHub, they, they could be solved in the future with GitLab since it's open source. Okay. And this, this service, I, 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 I mean, there's probably a lot of ways as the community develops more tools there, I, I don't know what they would be, but since GitLab is open source, I, I don't see reason to put it uh, on there. Um, I guess we don't have an organization on GitLab right now. That I don't know. Um, I, a lot of stuff has been set up on GitHub, so I, I don't know how that migration stuff works. But I, I did see that uh, Jose had suggested that he had migrated to, to GitLab and things like that to test things. So mm -hmm. um, I had started looking at that before, and I think it's it's basically the same. It's it's a web service the same way. So. The scalability of that just depends on their business model. I mean, essentially, we're using it for free data and whatever other uh, tools are useful. As long as we do the distributive, uh, distributed infrastructure so people host different projects on their personal things and then OSC, like this, say the formal organization account, we can draw from that. I think that's fine to have it in different locations at this point. Different. Yeah, Different locations. Okay. Yeah, like you set up yeah, just like you had um, Wits on GitHub, just set up your own account and then we can draw from that yeah, I for OSC. My own account. I, I don't know what advantage there might be. I think on, on GitHub I think you have a an open source organization and I believe GitLab has that as well. I think the only features there may be like team organization, but that mm -hmm. that's just another layer of software. Uh, that I don't know if we want to use that. Um, I haven't really looked at how that works, so. Yeah, yeah, we're okay uh, as far as uh, just doing the distributed route to store store data, store files. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, trying to figure. I did I did find some more information as to how Git um, handles, I guess, binaries. I I, I thought the discussion before you said that binaries were not different, but it, it does look like. Git is supposed to attempt or consider attempting difference of binary files. It's just some delta method, which could help issues. But I think I think you were having some concerns about how uh, it might scale. And I understand since these are web services that are offering you know basically data storage and things, the way they work mm -hmm. on the back end, they shouldn't have a lot of issues with data uh, expanding from things like I guess it was forking. But I think if I understood what you were saying, uh, and some of the videos on the wiki, 
I believe that the forking, as long as data is not significantly different and files are just duplicated, there should only be one copy of, say, a file. The system should uh, technically deduplicate that. That's just a feature of like cloud, uh, so, you know, server software and all that. Uh, it just links uh, multiple users or owners of copies of files uh, that way. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, it doesn't generate. If they if they set it up right, then it shouldn't. Uh, a bunch of copies of extra files. Yeah, uh, it, it, mostly a question of their business model. If if it starts taking up a bunch of data on their server, because lots of people are putting open hardware projects on there, then that you know they can't keep uh, selling their services to give away the free space for other projects. That I mean, that's their business model currently. So, yeah, if it doesn't scale for them, then you know that becomes an issue eventually. But mm -hmm. uh, so for FreeCAD. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to figure out how to do some uh, piping host stuff in the workbench, and I've been trying to learn the draft workbench better. I, uh, I did put a photo there, but what I was attempting, I was having trouble getting the draft big to manipulate uh, working plane and change like complex angles so that I could direct um, curves through different uh, sort of like angles and dimensions and multiple which it should do i know it it does it but it's been difficult to get it to do it the way i want it and so i'm thinking that eventually i have to make maybe some kind of macro if i can figure out how to make it um, change certain settings there i think it's doable in the draft workbench but it, it's not so easy to do kind of three-dimensional curves and things so far um <clears throat> Mm -hmm. multiple angles for, for hoses and pipes and things like that. Um, so I, I have been learning some Python slowly, so eventually I think I'll get to figure out how to make a, a macro for that maybe. Mm -hmm. And maybe long term there's need for more workbenches or something to help with this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, sounds cool. Uh, just, mm -hmm. See, I also well, I was trying to figure out I started to do uh, some more free CAD tutorial stuff because I was trying to learn the um, the draft workbench, which I was, was familiar with. In some ways, I found, and from looking at other people's files, I, I often learn uh, much more stuff I didn't think about. But um, I, I started to record, try to record segments for tutorials, and I'm still considering what to go with those because I think there is. It sounds like a need for more general tutorials, maybe. Um, because the ones that we've got are, are real basic. They cover everything pretty thoroughly, but mm -hmm. maybe some more usage tutorials. I was trying to figure out that, and I, I've been attempting to record some of those, but I haven't got the the scripts and everything down or, or practiced enough yet. To yeah. my, my recording so far haven't been so good yet. Um, and I may make more changes, but um, kind of starting with some like workflow stuff and changes so any any input on that i guess would be good at, uh only thing i can sure say what, that what, from what? the boot camp we did produce i i went through like an hour overview of the sketcher to 3d workflow which is kind of the basic osc workflow have you seen that one yeah um i think it's a video or recent i think i've seen everything on the freecad 101 page if it's a recent video you did maybe not um, yeah, so there's another. I have. Hold up, hold up. Yeah, there's one. I'll post it to the workshop's Facebook page, but there's a YouTube video, just like a one hour more lengthy discussion, kind of on the framework of the basic OSC workflow, where basically with moving parts, rotating parts, sketching and, and extruding into 3D, then drawing on sub subsequent faces. You can get a lot of complex geometry going right there. Uh, let me see. Let me just paste that onto, yeah, basic FreeCAD workflow. Um, I'm actually posting that on OC workshops. That's that's now nothing is constrained useful. here, so you can move things around. Basic so you can grab that. FreeCAD. Uh, you can grab that side, uh, and then. Okay. I, think sketches. I saw most of the. You could do anything. Videos from the workshops or listen to those. Um, yeah. What I'm still trying to figure out sometimes in FreeCAD is how to keep it, uh, how to keep the chain or the history in the tree from becoming, creating problems where 
you can't edit stuff in, in like you know further back in the history in the tree where it doesn't break it and so on. Uh, sometimes yeah. that that's so for certain features. So I will say once again that we want to reduce the process to the simplest absolute possible with the view of getting hundreds of people involved in, in massive events, which we haven't done yet, but we want to think of, of that as a distinct possibility. So, so merges of simple files is the way to go, so a lot of people can work on individual files and then uh, you merge them into a single document where, where the complexity, like you strip the complexity by breaking it down just like the general open source product development method, you break down into as small parts as possible and then you assemble into larger structures. But I think the, the merge workflow addresses a lot of that where we try to edit um, everything at the, at the broken down level of individual small parts. And therefore, if you have trouble with the history getting, like the parts tree getting messed up, I think the at this stage of FreeCAD, I think a good solution is to rebuilding from parts where you're importing one after another especially if the parts are saved positionally correct. So once again, that basic basic workflow where when you import something, it appears in a correct location as in the entire assembly. I still will promote that kind of workflow because it, conceptually it's like when you talk about um, say the design jam concept where you have novices trying to participate in, in development projects, you want to make it such that a person can get introduced to FreeCAD in like an hour, very basic hour of study, like hour to study, and then it can actually start becoming basically functional in, in various paths. And of course, they have to practice to get any, you know, any fruitful in it, but, but I think, once again, trying to simplify to the most basic possible process is still the name of the game. Um, so, so therefore, like, I'm, I'm on FreeCAD 16. Like that's the that's still on a on a free cab, the OSC Linux. I think we want to stick to that for a little bit and uh, without getting into the 17 and 18. As uh, I mean, anyone can use that, but but to keep it simple for a larger audience, we want to go go to the the most intuitive version at this point, which I think 16 uh, would be. On on the versioning, I noticed in one of the videos you suggested that there seemed to be a difference between. The installed an installed version and yeah. uh, one on a Linux stick. Yeah. Is that I'm wondering if maybe an older version of the Linux stick and maybe there's a difference with um, one advantage of the FreeCAD 16 at this point is that it's they're now they're calling it FreeCAD Legacy and that's stable. That's not going to be ch or static. It's not going to be changed anymore. Right. As I understand. So uh, I mean, if that's I don't know if that's been updated to the final version on the Linux, OSC Linux, so maybe that's an issue. I don't know if the builds were uh -huh. different. Uh, yeah, I think... Builds because yeah, what, you, what you're mentioning is, uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, update OSC Linux to the, st to the last version of 16, because um, when we made it, I'm not sure which version, if we had the final, final stable version, we can look at that again. But no, that's a, that's a good idea, uh, to go, go to a legacy version that we know is uniform for everybody. Yeah. I think most of the features are in 0.16. As I understand, there might be uh, some things in 0.17 that, that that work in there that we want to do that don't quite work in 0.16, but mm -hmm. the, even though the, some of the features are in there, they're just like buggy because certain other features weren't added until 0.17, so it's like some of those features don't quite work right. But, right. Um, I guess it, in FreeCAD Linux before, I think we had two versions of uh, FreeCAD in there. So, point one six stable, and then maybe a, a whatever the latest point one seven is for a Linux update would be great. But I know that that Linux update is obviously a, a difficult thing, especially when you have dozens of USB sticks you have to re uh, redo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's. Uh that's that. So, anyone else? Uh, any other reports? We were getting back to the, the team here. Oh, uh, tax again. Uh, other thing I thought of is I uh, started to work on um, some general code uh, for business back here. I'm going to start uh, using my prev. Uh, I think four or five 3D printers now. So I'm going to uh -huh. start uh, 
an idea for a uh, website where I'm going to um, allow people to select a 3D printed object and have uh, the printers automatically start a print or uh, request a print. And so cool. I think like having that kind of store environment for people to be able for any print cluster we have, for people just be able to buy and purchase or request prints. Yeah. Is important in that. Definitely. You know, that'll be off to the side because I mean, I'm having my other ones start to do that, but the OSC printer would do that as well. It's just kind of, you know, for in, all the industrial stuff, a mm-hmm. manufacturing execution system for tracking your products, your inputs, and all the rest, and continuous printing capability and all that kind of stuff. Just those are the things I'm getting interested in and um, I'm going to work on in the next couple of days. You guys are look, looking around on the uh, laws and be updating some pages for that. On, uh, just industrial life cycle and uh, you know, web page allow us um, customers to request prints and uh, some ideas in continuous printing that I have that I'm trying to design uh, the current, what I'm working on the PVC printer to allow it to do continuous printing down the line. So those are just some things I'm working on. Uh, what software on the back end for the cluster, for the printing cluster? Do you know what software that would be? What's that? Uh, do you know what software? What are? You, what would you use on the back end for the print cluster? That's the thing I haven't. I've been looking around for some uh, back end software, and I think it's something that's going to have to be uh, spun up. I mean, OctoPrint looks like the best open source solution, but just basically, I'm thinking it might be something like integrating OctoPrint with a general web page that would also need to be open source that we can provide to people so they can directly turn their print cluster into business, and that's auto starting, auto turning on a 3D printer, automatically printing, and just having a part pop out, you know, an open source piece of conveyance, put it into a bin, mm-hmm. just thinking of it like a uh, factory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it sounds good. That's that's something on a, on a roadmap definitely we'd like to do. We're not there yet. So um, hopefully we can make some of that happen. Great. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so that sounds good. So we're getting back to our meeting here. Uh, so thanks everybody for the meeting. And so we'll continue doing this at so at twelve thirty next Tuesday. We'll have the next uh, next session. So during the time of the immersion here, the twelve thirty works for us here since we've got the session in the afternoon. So we'll see you all next week then. Thank you.